very good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome again to uh, Indian Society of Gastroenterology Masterclass Series 2. Uh, happy Independence Day to everyone. Uh, this has been a pleasure to welcome all of you on this uh, very Sunday morning on a very important day, that's Independence Day. Last year, uh, uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic and lockdown, we have initiated uh, ISC Masterclass Series 1, and we had uh, 32 lectures uh, that point in time. Each one was uh, wonderful. So we wanted to, we had a lot of feedback uh, coming from a lot of uh, uh, DM, DNB trainees, and also from many of the faculty of IS, you know, faculty of uh, gastroenterology, that why don't we run a clinical case discussion? So last year we wanted to do it, but we could not do because of a number of other things happening in the country, like many other webinars and other things going on. So uh, it was always a dream to initiate a, a masterclass uh, on clinical case discussion with residents and the fellow trainees. So the dream came true today. Now we're starting our first uh, uh, session on clinical case discussion. And the focus here and objective here is to learn uh, or convert, learn the clinical symptoms and interpret that uh, what disease the symptoms are caused by. And this is very important and which uh, uh, I, le I learned from Dr. Uh, Dr. Gautha Chaudhary, he always said that DM and DNB is not about uh, making a diagnosis. It's about making interpretation of symptoms and understand from that and make a diagnosis. So the whole objective of this uh, masterclass series two uh, is to accomplish that objective and learn from each other uh, that how do how do we interpret the clinical symptoms and make an appropriate clinical diagnosis. It's not important to make a right diagnosis, but it's important to make a logical diagnosis. But making a right diagnosis certainly is very, very important, but we have to follow a logical pathway. Otherwise, we believe that this is all, uh, we saw this, I've, I've been tipped about the diagnosis and therefore, uh, though your, your evaluation may not be very appropriate. So with these uh, a few words, uh, let me introduce to, and we, this, in this uh, series, we'll have a 12 uh, clinical case discussion. And if uh, uh, the program goes well and it becomes a learning experience for all of us, then probably do uh, some more. But at this time, we have a plan to do 12 clinical case discussion, all at the same time, all using same link, uh, same time means uh, uh, 11 30 to 1 o'clock on every Sunday from uh, today onwards uh, till 12 Sundays. Uh, with this, uh, uh, let me invite Dr. Uh, Kocher, uh, Dr. Rakesh Kocher, who has been my teacher and, and, and uh, uh, who always impressed me uh, with his uh, dedication to work and, and diligence in his uh, dealing with patients. The Kocher presently is the president of uh, Indian Society of Gastroenterology, and he'll address to you, uh, Kocher, sir. Well, uh, good morning, everybody, on this auspicious day. As Dr. Govind has uh, briefly introduced, this is a masterclass in clinical gastroenterology and uh, a series of 12 such sessions will be held. And the idea is to have interaction among a select group of faculty, different for each masterclass, with uh, DM, DNB residents from different institutions across the country. Uh, as has been brought out very well that it is not important to reach the correct diagnosis, but it is important to analyze history and physical findings in a logical manner. The Any bedside discussion is, you cannot teach anyone uh, in one hour or two hours so the idea of any bedside discussion or clinical discussion is to generate curiosity and uh, insight into the nuances of clinical gastroenterology. So I think uh, the learning point of this kind of activity will be that the residents, DM or DMB students go home and brush up their gastroenterology, the pathophysiology of disease, how to interpret symptoms and signs, and integrate them into a logical
is the coach audible to all of you uh, no okay so i think there's a some audio issue so uh, taking from there i mean uh, we let me introduce to you the faculty for today uh, we have a dr b s ramakrishna i think all of us know him he is one of the uh, best known uh, lunar gastroenterologist in our country his work has been uh, in lunar gastroenterology have been tremendous and uh, we believe that he is teacher to all of us uh, dr ramakrishna uh, presently is uh, director of uh, Gastro sectional gastroenterology at SRM Institute of uh, Gastroenterology at uh, SRM Institute of Medical Sciences in Chennai. Uh, welcome, Dr. Uh, Ramakrishna. Thank you. Uh, and we have a second again. One a lecture kind of a thing on chronic diarrhea, followed by a clinical case discussion. Presentation by the residents from Ames today. Next time it will be another institution and so on. So. Over to the AIMS team. Yes, and uh, the coach, you have not been audible for in between for a couple of minutes. So let me also introduce Dr. Vargis Thomas, uh, who is the, again he was a professor of gastroenterology, head of gastroenterology at uh, Calicut Medical College, a esteemed teacher. Uh, presently, is is at the Malabar Hospital in 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 Calicut. Uh, Dr. Thomas uh, has conducted a session for. Uh, residents in southern part of India, and he's one of the uh, he's one of the passion I would say uh, is to teach. So, and you know the coach uh, uh, is uh, again one of the best teachers in our country. So, with uh, I'm also joined as a faculty. So, four of us uh, in the faculty side to discuss the case, and we have two very bright residents from Ames, uh, Dr. Mukesh Ranjan uh, and Dr. Samag Pagrawal. Both of them are third year uh, residents and they will appear exam uh, in December. So what Mukesh and Ranjan, uh, Mukesh and, and uh, Dr. Samagra will do, do the case presentation and we'll discuss the case. Uh, to all of you who are joining on this clinical case discussion, we request you uh, to please uh, uh, put your question or comments on the chat box and we'll visit the chat box uh, as, in, as in when we uh, get to the case. Uh, we want uh, this to be very interactive, engaging session uh, uh, and we want this to be a very learning experience for each one of us, so that we go home uh, with some uh, some point learned today. We are not going to rag a uh, Samagra and uh, Mukesh. Uh, they are the clinical discussants, and we all six of us do together justice to this case and bring back the objective that how do we interpret or how do we reach to a diagnosis in patient who presents to us as a chronic diarrhea. With this, uh, I, I will uh, briefly uh, summarize, uh, briefly uh, present uh, a case, uh, not case, uh, I mean, how to interpret uh, the, uh, the patient with chronic diarrhea. I would speak for five, seven minutes and then hand over the case to, uh, to Samag and Mukesh. Uh, Denise, can I share my screen? Yes. Is my screen visible to all of you? Yes, yes. Yes. So, so what are we going to do? Uh, that how do we approach a patient with chronic diarrhea and what are the basic principles uh, in addressing that? So first, uh, uh, the first question comes that, uh, and the most important to making diagnosis of chronic diarrhea is about looking at the stool, that how the stool is, and that gives the diagnosis. So while approaching, what is important is it a frequency? Is it a liquidity or, or fluidity of stool? Or is it a volume of stool? All three are very important. And let me address what, why the three are important. And, and so what drive frequency? We all know frequency is driven by rectum. Once stool comes to the rectum, rectum mucosa gets uh, is sensitive and it drives the reflex. And therefore the, the signal goes to brain. Then you get a, a contraction of rectum and all other activity which happens at the pelvic floor to lead to, uh, to passes of stool. And in those pelvic floors, the synergia, the stool passes may be, uh, may be obstructed. And these patients have a persistent stool in the, uh, persistent stool in the rectum. Therefore, there's a repeated desire to pass stool. They have more frequency, but this is not diarrhea because uh, high frequency is not always means diarrhea. It's type of stool which makes it diarrhea. 
So those patients who have perpetual dyssonancia will have high frequency, but this is not called diarrhea. Now we come to uh, looking at, uh, so high frequency is not the indicator for diarrhea always. Coming to what drives the uh, uh, fluid or liquidity to a stool. And we all know that liquidity of stool occurred because of a volume secreted in the small intestine uh, in the conditions of acute infective uh, uh, enterocolitis can be because of malabsorption and also it can be because of secretory disorders. That disorders of uh, hormonal release which can lead to a lot of more secretion of hormones and lead to a lot of water secretion in the small intestine. And, and it has a very special characteristic. I'll come back to that in a minute time. So the effluent of, uh, of a small intestine uh, volume, it comes to the colon and it is absorbed. So what is the efflux is not the reflection of the disease. Efflux of stool is after colonic uh, passage, uh, passes through the colon. Therefore, the content of small intestine has been modified by large intestine. Please remember this, that even there's a small, diffuse because of disease of small intestine, the stool may not be, may look to be normal to patient because the volume has been absorbed, uh, which large volume came to small intestine, uh, uh, from small intestine to large intestine, but large intestine absorbed majority of volume. Therefore, the volume may not be large, uh, always. So therefore, keep in mind that all small bowel diseases do not have large volume at every time, and all because of a colonic effect. So normal definitions we know is more than three stools and volume is more than 200 ml. But most important is the Bristol stool chart. I'm aware, and, and even myself, I was not using this chart in my young days, but I understood the importance of this chart, I started using it. And this is very important concept. It's just not the name of Bristol stool chart, it's an important concept. What the concept? Normal stool is type three, type three or type four, right? Longer they stay in the colon or in the rectum, the, these stool become drier because of colonic absorption. Uh, they ab colon absorb water from the stool and they become dry. And as they become dry, the surface becomes uh, very, very kind of, uh, and they break as it becomes more dry. So as you go up, the stool is more drier, it is no, no volume to it, right? And as you go down to this, we have more water in the stool. So type four, type five, type six, type seven has more water, means what? That stool is not able to get dehydrated in the colon. It means that there's a, the more volume is coming from a small intestine to large intestine, and therefore this water is not enoughly absorbed, and therefore this is a type five, type six, seven. So this tells you the amount of water in the small, in the, in the stool. Higher grade, less water, lower grade, I mean, lower grade in the sense, uh, lower in the tape, lower in the chart, they have more water. Please remember this while making a diagnosis. Sometimes patients say, I have four frequency stools, a stool type is type one or two. So this is not chronic diarrhea. Frequency is not only thing which is important. Important is the type of stool. And this is the most, most important thing while interpreting a patient's chronic diarrhea. And coming to one other important point, which is the volume. High volume or low volume. We all have been taught from the very beginning, low volume means, uh, low volume means large bowel disease. Small intestines should have a high volume, but I told you even a small intestine may not have high volume because of a colonic effect, the colon absorbs this water. The other important thing is the content and type of stool. And the content and type of stool is again a very important concept. Those patients who have a secretory diarrhea, they will have more water. So if the colon ever releases more water uh, in the stool, it is uh, nothing but secretory diarrhea. Please remember this. Acute diarrhea, acute infective colitis, like cholera or infective colitis, they have more water in the stool. If this happens time and again, multiple times, repeated episodes, this is nothing but the secretory form of diarrhea. Large volume water stool has just one meaning, that this is a secretory form diarrhea, and we often miss in clinical practice. Uh, so if a stool volume is high, high volume, high frequency, watery content, high volume, high frequency, and volume is watery, it's nothing but secretory diarrhea. Please remember that. And they require a special form of investigations. If you do upper G endoscopy, colonoscopy, they will not lead to diagnosis. High volume, high frequency, 
watery content is nothing but secretory diarrhea. High volume, uh, high frequency, low volume is more likely to be a large bowel type and high volume or normal high volume, normal high volume in small intestine. So small intestine don't have any specific characteristics, but large volume, it may suggest small, small intestine type. We know etiology of a small intestine, large intestine is huge. We are not going to go in depth of it. You are, you, you are all aware about, and we discussed this point uh, in the case once we discuss uh, the clinical case today and important cause of chronic diarrhea. Same large intestinal diarrhea have different causes, function on organic. So we'll look at that. Uh, I might a point that tuberculosis is not important for the chronic diarrhea, which is often discussed uh, in the clinical bedside. And how do you approach? Again, I, all of you know about it. There are six or seven points. If you look at the uh, clinical bedside, a clinical, clinical query at a uh, uh, while in outpatient, outpatient or inpatient, uh, you define a cutter and chronic function, organic, small bubble, large bubble, volume and quantity to stool. To, to me, this is a very important point. Do they have malabsorption, painful, painless, bleeding disorders, or, or inflammatory, non inflammatory? And I might not like to discuss this with all of you because this is a very simple, common things which we have discussed uh, at multiple occasions, how to differentiate functional and organic, which uh, I'm sure that some of and uh, Mukesh will discuss uh, in the case discussion. But to remember uh, one important point, the enhanced gastrocolic reflex may point towards uh, a functional disease and duration towards functional disease. Similarly, if you look at small intestine, large intestine, one important part to differentiate is the volume and content of stool. If content is malabsorptive stool, is a small intestine disease. If there's a blood in the stool or mucus or pus, it tells you that the rectum is involved. Tenismus means rectum is involved, not the whole, G, whole large intestine. Tenismus means rectum. Volume of content, I already told you, large volume, high frequency is a secretary form of diarrhea. Uh, look at features of malabsorption once you look at uh, the symptoms of a carbohydrate, fat, and protein. The carbohydrate, you can have weakness, clotting, flatulence, uh, borborimi, or distension. Fat loss could be because of low body fat. Bo low BMI is indicator of low body fat. And stetoria, which is not very common symptom, uh, if that is there, that tell tells you that there's a fat malabsorption. And protein, we define into two, visceral protein and somatic protein. Visceral protein is a body protein, muscle mass, and somatic protein, Sorry, somatic protein is, is a muscle mass. Visceral protein is albumin. Means albumin means uh, uh, edema or ascites. And then please remember, if somebody has edema and ascites, please always consider lymphatic blocks. Uh, normally, uh, a chronic small intestinal disease will not much have uh, edema and ascites. But whenever you see it's chronic diarrhea and edema, always think of is there a lymphatic block? It is a disease called lymphangiectasia. Look for vitamin deficiency. And these are very, very important uh, uh, clinical features. Uh, again, you will like know the cause of small and large intestine are many inflammatory and non-inflammatory and look at inflammatory features in terms of fever and joint pain. Uh, we have uh, inflammatory disorders like tuberculosis, Stone's disease, ulcerative colitis can have these features, but uh, other mucosal disorders may not have these features. Pain abdomen, if diarrhea also associated with pain abdomen, then remember two things. One, that anybody who has a chronic diarrhea will have abdominal discomfort. And all of us has our own personal experiences. That acute diarrhea, large amount of water in the small intestine, small intestine contracts, that's leads to, that's leads to pain abdomen. But this is a crampy pain abdomen which relieves the passage of the stool. So this is different pain. So any pain which relieves the stool is because of a content got released from a small intestine to the, uh, as evacuated as a, stool, as a stool. But if the pain persists, and pain like intestinal colic which persists, then tells you there's a luminal disease. And this is a very important point that we're talking this pain pain about luminal disease. It means there's a stricture in small intestine. There's a mucosal disease, along with there's a stricture in the small intestine or large intestine can have this kind of, so all mucosal disorders will have, will be painful, painless generally, but disease like tuber Crohn's disease or Ipsid or could be painful. Also remember that you always talk about chronic pancreatitis. But chronic pancreatitis is a totally different disorder. Only few patients, and, and I hardly to see patients with chronic pancreatitis who present to us with chronic diarrhea. They will come with pain abdominal like chronic pancreatitis, and diarrhea, you ask them, they will say, I have diarrhea, or I have hysteria. 
but they will hardly come to you with a steatoria. So chronic pancreatitis uh, diagnosis, keeping diagnosis in a painful diarrhea is not appropriate. <laughs> also look at bleeding manifestations. Bleeding means there's ulcer in the GI tract, somewhere ulcer in the GI tract. Therefore, it's a more of inflammatory disease. Bleeding with chronic diarrhea is a more of inflammatory disease, but also please mind that if there's a hemorrhoids, which is very common in population, 10% of our population has hemorrhoids. If they can bleed in, they have chronic diarrhea because of diffuse mucosal disease, but they also have hemorrhoids. Let's not confuse, right? Therefore, to know more about bleeding is important and localized bleeding uh, uh, separately. The bleeding causes this, diarrhea is this. Now, both together, what is the diagnosis? So put them, all of them together. So what I mean, information you got, put them together. And, and, uh, and if you put them together, you always have automatic diagnosis. For example, you talk about uh, age, gender, duration of disease, you talk, summarize, once summarize the patient, small bowel type, suppose they're giving case, organic in nature, features of malabsorption, painless, having no blood, have no feature of inflammation. What the diagnosis? Diffuse small intestinal disease. Because malabsorption tells you the diffuse disease of small intestine. If part of small intestine affected, will not lead to malabsorption. If there's a malabsorption, it simply means there's a diffuse involvement of uh, small intestine. Take a different case. Age, duration, we talk about six years duration of the uh, symptom in a 45 years old person, large bowel type of diarrhea, looks functional in nature. Pain, they often pain, no blood, no inflammation. What the diagnosis? This is a functional GI disease. Likewise, ulcer colitis, likewise, uh, secretary from diarrhea. Look at this patient. Three years, organic disease, small bowel type, large volume, watery, there's urgency, no blood, no inflammation, nothing but secretary from diarrhea. So taking a good clinical history, give a good examination, summarizing them into systematic uh, order, and, and you will make an interpretation. You might be wrong when you find diagnosis, but that's immaterial. I think with this, I'll stop here and, and, and with this introduction and, and request uh, now Dr. Samagal Agrawal and Mukesh Ranjan uh, to start the clinical case, uh, uh, clinical case and uh, we go by uh, and then we discuss the case. Uh, again, request all of you uh, to put the questions in the chat box and we try to address to, to these questions uh, as we go along. Samagal and uh, Mukesh. Thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to uh, Professor Makaria, Professor Kocher, Professor Thomas Vargis, and Pro Professor Balkrishnan for making us part of this. And without wasting much of time, I would like to pros uh, proceed with the case presentation. Uh, uh, sir, uh, so, uh, right. So, uh, I will start with the history of. Uh, uh, I will start with the history first, then we will follow by uh, the general examination and other part by Dr. Samagal. So we have a very interesting case. Uh, I think after uh, uh, listening to uh, Professor Makhara, we will be able to correlate now well with this case. Uh, this uh, gentleman, uh, Mr. MKS, who is a 31-year young male without any non-prior comorbidities. He is resident of West Sampar and Bihar. Uh, uh, he is an energy auditor in Department of Electricity and he says he has to audit the energy consumption. For that, he is out of the town for most of the days in travel to all over the India. He is married for the last three years and has a baby. Most, as I said, he is most of the uh, time out of the town and consumes meal from out of uh, home. That means from hotel he stays. Coming to the chief complaints, uh, his symptoms dates back to 2017 when he started having loose stools. And what he describes his symptoms as watery, and what typically he says, his stool is like water of dal with no solid content in it. That's a month uh, Bristol stool chart of seven. He passes 15 to 20 such fall smelling stool every day, and he has significant uh, nocturnal frequency. That means he has to pass five to six stools after falling asleep, and that hampers his uh, sleep as well. He says he has jets of large volume diarrhea coming out every single time he goes to his stool. Uh, he says he has to run for this uh, past his stool. He has urgency and at times he also has 
incontinence while he is asleep. Uh, every time he passes the stool, he uh, the stooling is preceded by gurgling sound and colicky pain, in predominantly in periumbilical region. Coming about the, the progression of symptoms, he says the diarrhea presents is most of the, uh, almost every day. The symptoms uh, frequency and severity has been increasing over the period of time, and uh, and right at the onset, over the first five months, he had significant loss of weight of 20 cases. However, he states he has preserved appetite. Few of the episodes of uh, diarrhea were severe, requiring him to be admitted. There is no associated uh, blood, mucus, or oil drop in his feces. He has no uh, associated fever, night sweat. There is no associated Episode of frank bowel obstruction, that means uh, distension, recurrent uh, vomiting, inability to pass fishes or uh, flutters. There uh, is no clear cut aggravating factor. There is no relation to meal or fasting. And he also uh, uh, denies any history of stomatitis, glossitis, vision impairment, bony pain, or arthralgia. Some relevant past histories. A uh, few of the episodes of diarrhea improved actually with antibiotics alone that he took by himself from uh, the nearby pharmacy. And as I said, the, uh, he was admitted at a couple of occasions for severe episodes that too subsided with conservative treatment with antibiotics and IV fluids. He remains uh, well for around 20 days after remission of symptoms. However, the symptoms recur and he could not recall any aggravating factor as such. Now, I would like to highlight some treatment history. In 2019, he was treated with tinidazole and cortimoxazole for three months, along with gluten-free diet from one of the attending physicians. And he says uh, after taking this, he remained quite well, absolutely fine. Uh, and he gained a pretty uh, morbid uh, weight for one year. So since 2019 to 20, he remained absolutely fine with antibiotic for three months and gluten-free diet. However, in 2020, he started taking general food, he started taking wheat, chapatis, and other food that uh, potentially contains gluten. Still, he remains well, and his weight gain that was achieved in initial first year remains static. But in 2021, this year in January, he has recurrent some symptom, but he denies any aggravating factor for this. In personal history, as I said, he is most of the times away from home. He consumes meal from the hotel, how he has no high risk behavior for uh, studies. He's not an uh, alcohol consumer, neither is a smoker. Now, to summarize uh, the history, a young male without any prior comorbidities, presenting with a four year history of progressive large volume, watery diarrhea, associated with polyky, pain abdomen, and significant loss of weight. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Mukesh, uh, for that uh, nice presentation. But I would like to have certain clarification on a history. Uh, how was the onset? You said the, the illness is for the last five years. So I presume that it started in 2016. How was the onset? Was it uh, just an abrupt disease or a very insidious disease? Sir, yeah, yes, sir. Uh, it was an abrupt onset. He recalls he was fine. And one day uh, he started having loose stools. Okay. okay. So, so the onset was abrupt. Okay. And then it lasted for a couple of weeks. Second thing you said, there's a weight loss in the first five months. He lost right. weight in the first five months and subsequently regained it. But now from 2020 or 21, uh, beginning, he is having again problems. So is there any recurrence of the weight loss? Is he losing weight now or is it remaining static? Yes, sir. He's losing weight. Every time he has diarrhea, he starts to lose weight, but his appetite is preserved. So he, when we took history, a couple of days back only, he, he, he had loss of weight. Okay. So, he, so recently he has again weight loss. Okay. Now, uh, from 2016 to 2019, uh, when he... Uh, took a gluten-free diet and he needed salt. Uh, did he go to hospital and get any sort of treatment or any evaluation done? No, sir. Uh, actually, yes, uh, he was evaluated. That will come subsequently in this uh, invasion okay. part. Uh, we, we don't want it now. Now, I just want to know, and each episode, uh, ever since the onset of diarrhea till he took a gluten diet and tinnitus salt, was it a continuous sort of thing or an intermittent diarrhea which lasts for a couple of weeks and then settles down and again comes back after uh, a couple of days? Sir, it is a continuous type of diarrhea. Diarrhea remains on every single day. 
uh, but when he takes anti, he used to take antibiotics uh, that used to subside food by 15, 20 days only to come back again. And when he was treated with tinidazole and cotrimoxazole along with gluten free diet in 2019, he remained fine for a couple of years. Then again, okay, thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Over to, uh, over to other faculty members. Dr. Ramakrishna has a point to make. And then we ask them to in interpret the uh, case. Uh, yeah, no, no, I, I think that's a nice presentation. So I think uh, some of the things that you talked about, and this is a guy who has a touring job. He is out of home a lot of time. So history of, uh, you, you, you have talked about a history of extramarital relationships, he, which he doesn't have, which I think is very important in a setting like this. Uh, somebody with chronic diarrhea, who is from a relatively rural area. Uh, the one thing which is very curious is that why was tinidazole and cotrimoxazole given for three months? And was he investigated prior to that? I think Dr. Varghis has asked that. That could be a significant clue to the etiology of his problems. Uh, yes, actually, uh, yes, he was uh, investigated from 2017 onward as well. Uh, but he says he, uh, he, he, when he used to take antibiotics, that I presumably was Flazil. He says he, he used to take Flazil and the diarrhea could subside for a couple of uh, weeks as well. So, and, but it could, uh, it kept on recurring after that only. So, the, the other investigation that was done in between will come in investigation part. So the, uh, there must have been a strong point favoring starting uh, this uh, uh, antibiotics. For this. Uh, I'm sorry, it wasn't clear to me whether the three months was a continuous three months of cotrimoxazole. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's continue. a strange combination of medicines, medicines to give. Right? And so there must have been a reason for that. Right, sir. He, he says okay. he must... we'll come to that in the discussion. Yeah. The coacher makes points. Uh, Dr. Mukesh, you summarized that he had colicky pain abdomen, but you didn't describe it ex exactly. Yeah, uh, yes, sir. I would like to explain this. Uh, his pain is not of an obstructive type. Uh, uh, his pain is a colicky pain that uh, improves after passing stool. And he never had a frank episode of obstruction leading to distension, recurrent vomiting, or inability to pass parts or uh, stool. So uh, by history, it appears that the pain is colicky in nature, that is for propelling the amount of stool or the liquid that is present inside the gut. So every stool is preceded by this pain. Is yes. it discomfort or pain? Sir, uh, uh, he, ha he has pain, sir. He says there is okay. cramp, there's spasm, then he run runs to stool, and then it gets weak. Okay, and is there bloating, distension, borborygmy? Borborygmy, uh, yes. Yes, yes, there is gurgling sound, he says, uh, but no significant bloating. But I presume most of us uh, has have some amount of bloating, but that is not to that extent that he could uh, bring it into his complaints. So he has gurgling sound, he has borborygmy, but no significant bloating itself. Uh -huh. okay. And uh, any history of uh, others? Comorbidities and drugs for that pain, pain, headache, backache, NSAIDs, or any herbal drugs. That that would be important. You know the detailed history of drug intake. If a person is with three years getting flagell and uh, a combination of uh, cotrimoxazole, so I would believe that uh, the treatment is not exactly rational. And uh, the, the, you need to elaborate on the history of drugs received, allopathic as well as herbal? I guess, sir, uh, uh, he does not have any uh, 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 pre-comorbidities. For that, he took uh, medicine. He became symptomatic only for this diarrhea. Otherwise, he used to be absolutely fine. He was a very active man, what he says. And uh, medications he took was only for this diarrhea, which most of the time was flazil. He says metron does not and uh, till he says flazil, that is metronidazole, and rifaximin as well, but he said there was no improvement with rifaximin. He took, uh, wherever he went, he was prescribed rifaximin short courses of uh, okay. weeks. Uh, can you now, uh, can we go to uh, our inter interpretation of findings now? Uh, because we have to, uh, what will be, how to interpret? Uh, so, 
so 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 govin is is he going to just summarize in a word and say what it is or uh, interpret the, find the findings now okay no, 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 interpret, no, no. The, interpret the interpret the symptoms symptoms yes right sir uh, we have that in subsequent slides so, uh, i would like to invite samagra my colleague for uh, the further proceedings no can you can you able uh, can you make a sort of a syndromic diagnosis sir, it, as to what the etiology is uh, yes, and yes, then yes, sir, yes, sir. tell us uh, the possible he, or probable differential diagnosis at this point he is coming to it sir he is coming to it okay. uh, so are you interpreting now after the clinical k after the summary yes. and interpret each symptom and try and learn from each symptom where the disease in small or large intestine is it a mucosal yes, disease yes. is a luminal disease it is a hormone secretion what it is uh yes yeah, sir uh, with this history and without examination what we can make out of these symptoms is he has la large volume watery diarrhea that seems to be organic because it's significant loss of it and not zonal symptoms so definitely his organic diarrhea and definitely uh, it's a large volume high frequency diarrhea watery stool so as i uh, we heard you speak it is most likely secretory type of diarrhea originating from the small bowel sir at this point and yes significant amount of malnutrition that he has weight loss that correlates with the source of diarrhea so weight loss uh, is mostly because of uh, diarrhea itself so there is a malnutrition as well so secretory type of diarrhea with malnutrition probably the source lies in the small intestine can can i make a comment here Yes, sir. Yeah. So I think, in addition to the types of diarrhea, which you said you distinguish between functional and organic, and you distinguish between large bowel and small bowel, and you the, the third is 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 that you distinguish between fatty, secretory, and inflammatory. Inflammatory. All right. So which of these three would you think this falls into? Is uh, it fatty, so secretory, is... or inflammatory? So this is secretory type of diarrhea because why do you uh, say it's not? Why do you say it's secretory? I mean, I would say it's inflammatory. Uh, so uh, secretory because the characteristic of stool uh, and 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 the frequency and volume is so, as well as uh, for inflammatory type, we don't have blood in his stool. He there is no uh, arthropathies or no fever. Uh, these sim these symptoms are absent, so it's more likely to be secretory rather than inflammatory. and yes uh, he has no fat though fat droplets are seen only in stream of the spectrum but uh, other thing lies uh, uh, sir no, no, so so bukesh so inflammatory is not necessarily to be confused with large intestinal it can be small bowel also yes and yes, so yes. this colicky pain abdomen to me that introduces an an element of inflammation right uh, and i'll, I'll uh, uh, join issues here to some extent you know the classification is watery fatty and inflammatory secretory and osmotic are two different uh, aspects of pathophysiology one exactly. should not bring them here yeah. and most diarrheas most diarrheas except for pure osmotic are a mixture of the two so let us not bring in osmotic and secretory here let us talk of the three and uh, yes uh, inflammatory can be small bowel as well so it cannot be said that inflammatory will be large bowel uh, mukesh can you go back to your slide uh, let, let's say, let us see first slide of your symptom that which is the most right. important slide uh, which tells you the diagnosis it tells you the diagnosis if we read Uh, the summary of it it says that uh, large volume it means whatever pathophysiology is there in the intestine is secreting large volume large volume can be because of malabsorption can be because of water secretion a two pathophysiology like uh, the question said osmotic or secretory nature uh, second would be that jets of water volume so it means the large volume is coming to large uh, from small intestine to large intestine so large intestine is not able to retain it because maybe because of increased motility there or the volume is too large uh, for the colon to get absorbed and therefore uh, and there is urgency what is urgency urgency means large amount of water has come to the rectum water stool has come to rectum and rectum can can't hold it if you can't hold it it will say severe signals to 
uh, rectal contraction to the brain and then efflux. And then you have urgency. You have to pass stool by, by it simply means the large volume of, of a, a stool content is being released into large intestine, coming to rectum, rectum responds to large volume and leads to urgency. I no. think, uh, yeah, that is one way to look at it. I would not totally exclude colon pathology here. Large volume of uh, watery content coming into the colon should be absorbed. So I would feel that uh, the colon salvage is not uh, totally functional. So there could be, unless there is motility problem, which will again suggest an inflammation of the colon, so I would say that uh, you cannot exclude right side, particularly the right side of the colon uh, as not being involved. I would at this moment keep small bowel diarrhea, not excluding colonic component in the pathogenesis. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. And one other point was that uh, when there's large volume of water in the small intestine or large intestine, the intestine will always contract. And to, to lead to it in flux, and therefore there will be pain abdominal. Yes. So the, this pain, uh, which takes along with this, it tells you what, whatever pathophysiology is there, the large amount of water is secreted in the small or large intestine, and large intestine is, uh, is responding to that and leading to pain abdominal. So this is what pathophysiology is in this uh, individual. Uh, Can I make a point? Uh, but before you that, make that couple of questions, which just take a few yeah. questions uh, from chat box, which uh, uh, the Alok has asked one question. Uh, no, but let me take a question of Prakriti. Uh, Prakriti asked that, uh, how do we define small and large intestine diarrhea? Now, what to ask the patient? Uh, Prakriti, uh, that uh, what uh, Mukesh also said, and I said in my presentation, that uh, small intestine, large intestine has some specific characteristics. Small intestine, if there's a diffuse disease, like mucosal malabsorption, therefore the volume may be large. Small intestine, uh, the volume may not always be large because most volume is being absorbed in the large intestine. Second, if you have blood in the stool or mucus or plus in the stool, it tells you that it is rectum is involved and inflamed. IBS patients do also have a large bowel diarrhea, but they don't have mucosal break, uh, break, therefore they don't have bleeding. But more frequency uh, tells you that this is it could be a large intestinal disease. Yes, Dr. Uh, Professor Makaria, in one of the sessions, one student asked me, what is the quantification above which volume, <clears throat> you call it large volume and above certain volume, we uh, call it small volume. And uh, I could not find any reference in the textbook apart from a vague mention in Susingia, which says that approximately one liter maybe is a cutoff between small and large vo um, volume. Uh, is there any 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 ideas on that particular aspect? Because that question also, how do we define small versus large volume? I think this is, this is I think a, a taking clinical medicine too to, to depth and uh, so there's no definition. Uh, there cannot be any definition. There cannot be any definition of a volume cutoff. There cannot be because uh, because the the etiology would be different of large and small intestine. Uh, it's just about small and large, but one liter certainly not because most even those patients have diffuse mucosal disease, like for example celiac disease or tropical flu, do not have a one liter. One liter is a volume described for secretive form diarrhea, where large amount of water is secreted in the in the, in the small and large intestine. That's defined for secretive, but not for small and large intestine. I think we have to take all these things into context, uh, defining small and large intestine rather than the volume only. And let's not go too much of depth uh, to all yes. the questions were there. Let's not go too much of depth. There are all these clinical pointers that you combine all of them together. It give you a pattern. It's not a diagnosis. Give you a pattern of small or large intestine. We cannot be defined on one single point. It's about all of three, four points uh, gives you an idea that this is a pattern of large intestine. What I felt that when such a patient is admitted into the hospital, <clears throat> perhaps we may be able to quantify it. Till then, we have to believe the words of the patient. When a patient is admitted and evaluated for chronic diarrhea, perhaps we can <clears throat> really collect the tools on a 24-hour basis and perhaps have an assessment of the <clears throat> volume. Till then, it is we have to believe the words of the patient. That's what I do. Two other questions come from our audience. One is Alok, who asked a very pertinent question. Uh, and I think we should take these questions now. Why blood is not a feature of small intestinal uh, inflammatory disease? Alok, you are right that uh, any small intestinal disease uh, like Crohn's disease or tuberculosis will lead to blood from blood in the small intestine. 
but this blood may not be visible to patient because amount of blood which secreted in the small intestine or large intestine, unless it's large in volume, this will not be visible to patient. Let's take an example, hemorrhoids, even one drop of blood, one drop of blood is visible to patient. Therefore, patient always complains blood in the stool. Ulcerative colitis, there's a blood in the rectum, therefore there's a bleeding, patient always knows there's a blood in the stool. But all small intestine disease or, or right side of large intestine disease can still bleed, but blood is not visible to patient. Therefore, uh, you cannot, patient will not come to you with this unless you do a cold blood test. And okay, I will supplement it by saying that the blood actually is there, but it is diluted. It is diluted so that the patient is not able to see it as blood because of the volume, volume is large. And second question again, Sanchit has asked uh, that uh, uh, should we commit, as the coach has said, should we commit uh, the diarrhea secretory, watery or fatty or inflammatory? I think uh, the, all the textbook and uh, the Yamada or Sassinger, they define diarrhea into inflammatory, fatty or watery. In clinical practice, uh, it's very difficult to differentiate. And in clinical practice, probably it's the more important the content of stool. Fatty means uh, you're talking about small intestinal disease. But again, this I can't get this by history. Unless you do a stool fat, you would never know, unless the stool fat is too large in, in the stool, the patient can see as a greasy stool or, or stool which sticks in the pan, but we cannot say that. And in small intestinal disease, there won't be fatty diarrhea. So I think we should keep away from these three questions of fatty, watery, or inflammatory uh, in the description. I think this difference is after the initial evaluation of this tool. Without a laboratory examination of this tool, it will not be really possible to say it is either inflammatory or fatty. So uh, actually, Schlesinger says it very clearly. After uh, analysis of this tool, it may be divided into uh, fatty or inflammatory. So I think it's not a clinical, it's not a clinical differentiation. I think I'll, I'll just add a bit. You know, for... Uh, 1970s to 2000, we just talked of small bowel, large bowel diarrhea. The pediatrics people were always talking of these three distinctions, fatty diarrhea, watery diarrhea, and inflammatory diarrhea. And we used to criticize them for, you know, trying to split here. But somehow this has crept into our textbooks also. And if, if the examiner says, what is the type of diarrhea your patient has? Then that is the question. You say fatty, like fatty, you, you, you can probably still say that uh, the hands become greasy or there is fat droplets visibly seen in a small minority, but you can still say that. Now, watery is watery. Inflammatory is the question. Now, the diarrhea which is inflammatory, the stool which is inflammatory should have mucus or blood or you have inflammatory symptoms. So we are talking of diarrhea only. So diarrhea inflammatory means if you have pus cells, if you have blood, if you have mucus. So uh, Thomas is absolutely right that this comes after initial examination of the stools. But if the examiner wants the candidate to commit, then fatty diarrhea can be committed, present or absent or unequivocal. Uh, watery diarrhea can be certainly committed. Inflammatory only if there is, you know, uh, pus or mucus then or blood, then you can say. Otherwise, you say that I cannot dif differentiate. So uh, I believe that most examiners will today uh, like to question the resident, what is the type of diarrhea in your patient? So you have to be very diplomatic in answering this question. So moving from there, I think we go to the uh, uh, Samag, who would like to give us a clinical diagnosis based upon what we discussed. And also this is very important for all of us to really uh, understand each symptom. As we, as we see each symptom, we keep interpreting our mind that to where the disease lies, be it uh, small intestine, large intestine, or any other organ. So uh, Samad, can you uh, give us a differential now? Uh, 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 discuss this case further and give a differential. Uh, Mukesh, can you uh, stop uh, sharing the screen? Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my job has been made easier uh, to a no, lot of uh, extent uh, because a uh, lot of the discussion. Some of you, has... wanted, to, some of you wanted to know the uh, your clinical possibilities. Uh, we go to clinical examination. Uh, uh, yes, sir. 
Uh, so, uh, uh, as Makharia sir pointed out earlier in his talk, uh, we always have to analyze the symptom that is present. In this case, diarrhea appears to be the predominant symptom. And uh, whenever we have diarrhea, uh, it is very important to uh, answer these seven questions uh, that help us in arriving at a differential diagnosis. Do we have acute or chronic diarrhea? Is the diarrhea functional or organic? Do we have a small bowel or large bowel involvement? Is there significant malabsorption? Uh, is there obstructive pain or uh, non-obstructive pain? Is the diarrhea associated with bleeding? Is it inflammatory or non-inflammatory? Or if we can make out uh, any feature suggestive of osmotic secretory or dysmotility related diarrhea. So uh, first, a uh, uh, very simple question, but uh, it is very important, especially in OPD practice. Do Are we dealing with functional or organic diarrhea? In this case, we have no blood. So uh, that probably... Uh, is in favor of functional diarrhea. However, we have a significant nocturnal frequency to the extent that the patient is having nocturnal incontinence. We have definite weight loss, which the patient had documented, and the patient is passing large volume of stools. All of these features favor organic diarrhea. And in this case, we definitely are dealing with a case of organic diarrhea. Next question comes is, is it a large bowel or a small bowel involvement? As uh, uh, the discussion till now has clarified, uh, when we talk of large bowel, we are mainly talking about the rectum, involvement of the rectum rather than involvement of the whole of colon. And as Kochasa pointed out, uh, involvement of uh, the proximal colon can also have features of small bowel diarrhea. Nevertheless, we still make that distinction because it is clinically relevant to our workup and uh, it gives us some idea how to proceed further. So in this case, uh, uh, small bowel diarrhea, uh, has a usually large stool volume which is present and rectal symptoms in the form of uh, tenesmus uh, urgency are usually present uh, which are absent in our case or at least they are not very prominent. Uh, steatoria, excessive flatulence and protein malabsorption will point towards a small bowel uh, um, uh, cause and we do have uh, features of bobogamy but uh, the patient does not complain of excessive flatulence uh, so we cannot comment on these uh, points. Pain abdomen is an interesting point. Uh, uh, in patients with the small bowel diarrhea, the pain is described as central abdominal and uh, which uh, usually might not improve with the defecation. Uh, in our case, the patient uh, complains of pain which uh, improves with defecation. So it has features of both uh, small bowel and large bowel involvement. So uh, considering all these points, uh, I would still like to commit to a small bowel type of uh, diarrhea. But uh, again, we can't, uh, when we say uh, small bowel, we cannot rule out involvement of proximal colon. The next question is uh, again interesting, is malabsorption present? Uh, we have a significant weight loss in absence of any inflammatory symptoms and the patient uh, has a, a low BMI. Uh, we haven't come to the examination, but uh, and the patient complains of gurgling bowel sounds and colicky pain, which are characteristically associated with carbohydrate malabsorption in which uh, the carbohydrate might be uh, fermented and it might increase the volume of the water in the bowel and that might contribute to these symptoms. Uh, we again uh, haven't discussed the examination and we did not have come uh, and we did not see any signs of micronutrient deficiency or pallor. So uh, all over this uh, suggests that the patient does have malabsorption uh, to the extent we can identify clinically. So uh, coming back to our symptom analysis, we have a diarrhea of four year duration. So this is definitely chronic. We have established that it's organic diarrhea. Uh, we have also established that there is small bowel involvement with probably some proximal colonic involvement. There is definite malabsorption. We uh, haven't come across any features of obstruction. So the diarrhea appears to be non-obstructive even though the pain is present. There is no bleeding that the patient complains of. Based on our clinical symptoms uh, alone, we cannot establish any features of inflammatory diarrhea. Although, uh, uh, Ramakrishna sir said that pain might be a feature of uh, inflammatory diarrhea. So overall, I would still like to commit to a non-inflammatory diarrhea at present. And I cannot uh, establish any features suggestive of osmotic diarrhea or any uh, secretory or dysmotility features. Uh, but overall, considering that the patient is passing large volume of stools uh, with a relatively high frequency, uh, I would like to commit to a secretory cause of uh, diarrhea. So overall, all these pointers point toward, so to summarize the case, what we have established clinically is a young male who has no significant comorbidities with uh, no significant drug history other than antibiotics prescribed for diarrhea itself. 
and he has a chronic diarrhea of four year duration, which is progressively increasing, uh, which is a large volume, which is associated with malabsorption and which does not have any clinically overt obstructive or inflammatory features. So uh, my pathological diagnosis at this stage would be a diffuse small bowel mucosal disease. Um, the possible differentials that I would like to consider at this point would include uh, tropical sprue, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, uh, intestinal lymphangiectasia, uh, certain immunodeficiency syndromes, or certain prolonged parasitic infections, and certainly bacterial overgrowth. Discuss it uh, wonderfully well. Uh, I just want to ask you, uh, how strong is the suspicion of malabsorption in this patient? Because the normally when somebody has malabsorption, you have features of carbohydrate malabsorption, protein malabsorption, fat malabsorption, then vitamin deficiencies, mineral deficiencies, so many things are there. So here the patient has got chronic uh, watery diarrhea plus weight loss. And the only other thing perhaps is borborgmi. Is that sufficient enough to uh, say that there is malabsorption? Uh, yes, sir. so uh, to my understanding, uh, the malabsorption uh, is a, there's a spectrum of findings and uh, the, uh, a lot of findings enter the clinical spectrum after a relatively long time. This patient has been uh, par partially treated. He has been admitted outside uh, multiple times and uh, he might have received certain treatment that might have uh, taken care of some of the features of malabsorption that have not become that overt as, uh, of, as of this stage. Uh, but uh, consider the fact that he has still lost weight. Add, uh, just in interest, interest of time, just like add one word because uh, that uh, the spec, as Dr. Thomas said, the spectrum of malabsorption will vary. If it is severe malabsorption, we'll have all classical manifestations like child A, child B, or child C cirrhosis. Child C cirrhosis have every feature of liver failure, but child A and child B has less number of feature of liver failure. So always keep in mind that uh, if disease is severely affecting the diffuse mucosa, then you will have more symptoms. If you have a mild disease, the symptom may not appear. And therefore we know that patients with celiac disease do present with a, a functional bowel disease like IBS, because the symptoms are not that remarkable uh, to present like a malabsorption, they present like a IBS. So we need to keep that in mind that is all, is every patient may not have all the features of a particular disease. It's all about uh, in a whole length of disease. I remember this straight line, and which I always tell, uh, I learned myself over time that every disease has to cross this line. And if patient, you may pick the patient here, early part of disease, you pick patient here, you may pick patient at end of disease. If you see at the end of disease, patient will have most classical manifestation, most classical symptoms. If you pick up a disease a year, year, year or two earlier, you may not have all classical manifestations. So that we need to keep in, in back of our mind that uh, every patient may not have every, uh, every feature of uh, uh, every disease. Yes, I do agree. I do agree yeah. that uh, there's a, uh, um, it's a, it's a perfect spectrum. So I just want to say, had that patient also may reduce the intake of certain type of food. For example, they may stop milk intake completely. They may stop fat intake to a significant extent, and therefore they cannot manifest with steatorrhea. So, a sort of withdrawal from certain food by the patient or as advised by the physician or local doctor also may contribute to the uh, say, uh, symptomatology, lack of symptomatology, which uh, we expect. So, in this patient with a significant weight loss, uh, uh, what do you think is the cause of weight loss in this patient? It is 70 kg. Okay. And if it is uh, early in the early in the evolution of uh, malabsorption syndrome, how do you explain 20 kg weight loss? Do you do you think you have to bring in some other etiology which will produce chronic diarrhea and uh, marked weight loss in spite of uh, the fact that uh, he is a very decent gentleman? Uh, I, I, I was going to add the same thing that two striking things in this patient were chronic diarrhea and really significant weight loss. So you did talk of 15 to 20 kgs, but you could have told us the baseline weight also. In any case, you said the uh, 15 to 20 for anyone would be really... So which of these conditions would account for that much of weight loss? Uh, sir, uh... 
basically uh, a long standing malabsorption that has been going on for uh, approximately 4 years uh, in I any of these condition can account for this degree of weight loss had he had no, no, uh, let's, 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 let's. Uh, dr mukesh you you have listed all these conditions right yeah so tell us with each one of them uh, yes uh, tropical stool patient with tropical stool can have that much of weight loss how, how many how many tropical screw patients have you seen in last 3 years uh sir very few uh, to be honest very few okay actually. so just just like that okay so that keeps tropical screw aside not on number 1 right go to the next one right. uh, crohn's disease yes they can have a significant loss of weight sir and we have seen a lot of cases of crohn's disease yes crohn's But disease pain pain no. pain Yes, four years, four years diarrhea only. That means isolated small bowel Crohn's disease. So again, how many patients would of Crohn's disease would have presented like this in last three years? Uh, diarrhea uh, and uh, with only diarrhea and significant loss of weight, uh, very few. But yes. Okay, so that also comes aside. So go to the next one. Celiac disease, uh, yes, uh, uh, many patients with loss of weight and uh, growth retardation and all. But uh, onset at this age and uh, significant loss of weight right at the onset, very few, sir. Okay, and in between, he was well. He had stopped gluten and felt better. Uh, but you can say that. Yes, sir. at that time he was also started on tinnitus and, uh, oh. and 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 uh, quadrimoxa so. But oh. after one year of asymptom matic period, he was started taking uh, gluten containing diets, but he did not have relapse of symptoms for next one year. So I I think okay, celiac disease. I have to make a, I have to make a point out here that uh, your observation that uh, celiac presentation at this age, again this is the point to understand. the celiac disease or tropical stool can present at any point of time celiac disease growth retardation is not essential it all depend it all depend upon at what age the disease severity is there so those those diseases which are very severe they manifest in childhood they have growth retardation but they also patient we don't know why but this there is a second hit the first hit is the uh, genetic and wheat intake the second hit may be viral Which leads to enteropathy, and that just precipitates uh, uh, the manifestations. And therefore, a lot of people call it adult onset celiac disease. It's not onset; it's a manifestation seen in adults, uh, so can occur. And celiac has been diagnosed for the first time at age of 60 years. It also applies to Crohn's disease. You can diagnose Crohn's for the very first time at 60 years of age or 70 years of age. So these points uh, uh, probably are not very strong point. You should argue on the point which are more more tenable. So age-based diagnosis, gender-based diagnosis are not a strong point you like to uh, consider uh, while ruling out or making a diagnosis. They are supportive points. Doctor Mukesh, can you still uh, consider celiac and uh, rule out the situation? Because uh, uh, patient, yes, is there any situation in celiac where this sort of scenario can happen? Yes, sir. Uh, like uh, Makhare sir said, there can be adult onset or even in elderly, uh, as elder, uh, uh, older than sixty years. But sir, uh, no. For uh, the uh, argument, sir, I agree that this is celiac disease. My question is that, in spite of adhering to gluten-free diet for the last one year, still he has uh, uh, developed diarrhea and uh, weight loss. So, how do you explain that? Or what are the scenario in which a, a person apparently taking gluten-free diet continues to have symptoms in a celiac disease? That's the issue. Yes, sir. Actually, uh, they can be refractory celiac, but most of the time, patients are not exclu exclusively on gluten-free diet because there are yeah. other diets and commercial food. No, he may think that he is uh, perhaps taking gluten-free diet and probably it is not really gluten-free. That is one possibility. Right. Or it right. may be non-responsive uh, gluten. This is, or he may have an underlying malignancy. Okay, that may be the reason why he is not responding. Uh, well, the la last point before good examination is going to make that if you look at pathophysiology of any of the diseases you described here, that he has a large volume of watery diarrhea, right? He has pain abdomen. So how the how does Crohn's disease will lead to large volume of watery diarrhea? What would be pathophysiology of that? 
In Crohn's disease, you have ulcerations, one ulcers, two ulcers, 10 ulcers, 20 ulcers, or different ulcers. These ulcers will exude the content, either because of defeat malabsorption, because of mucosal replacement by ulcers, or by secretion from the ulcer base, like proteins and the, like a protein, protein losing kind of a scenario. So that will not, not lead to watery form of diarrhea. What drives water in the uh, small or large intestine is the question here. So in tropical sprue also, the question comes in more of a, more of, more of a content. Uh, it's not watery. If your stool is watery, how does the watery stool occur in tropical sprue? How does the watery stool occur in, in celiac disease or say Crohn's disease? Its content is water. From where water is driving uh, into the intestine and which colon is not able to absorb and allow it to pass through the rectum. So would you think more than that? Some form of uh, uh, what drives water in the in the colon or, or a small intestine. It's only, it's only diffused because of disease by tropical celiac or, or giardia or what number of disease you enumerated. But does it, does it, does it make you happy that uh, what's happening really? Everywhere all disease is because it's replaced by some disease, but from where water is coming? Okay, Dr. Mukesh, you thrash out your remaining diagnosis and then we'll continue with the discussion. Professor Rama wants to say something, no? Uh, no, no, no. All, all I was going to say was that uh, fat, malabsorbed fat by itself, drives water secretion from the colon. True. So, that, that, so I, 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 on, on that one point, I would not necessarily try. I mean, this, this has been shown time and again that hydroxy fatty acids, unsaturated fatty acids, drive secretory diarrhea or water secretion in the colon. Uh, and the only comment I'll make to Mukesh is, which I think you've already made, is that you have to uh, arrange your, you, you've given a range of diagnoses, I completely agree with these, but you have to arrange it in the, in, in the chances of likelihood. Which do you think is first, is, is, is what should come first. And what you think is less likely should come towards the last. Uh, I, I don't know if this is arranged in what you think is the most likely way. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I totally agree with uh, this, but we, we have just put our differentials, actually. Uh, okay, now uh, there's a question by, by Dr. Rajender and Dr. Matri that uh, would you consider HIV uh, related diarrhea in these patients? Immunodeficiency is mentioned. But you also like to maybe keep uh, it in secondary. Yeah, patient. HIV, I think uh, even if the patient says that the patient always can deny virus behavior, especially when asked publicly in front of others and all. So I think in a chronic diarrhea weight loss, HIV has to be there. It has to be always ruled out. It's a must. Okay. That's what I say. Let's go to the clinical. It's, it's already it's mentioned the there in immunodeficiency. So it's acquired immunodeficiency. So it's already there. Yes. Yes, sir. Can you go to clinical examination now and uh, because of time, and then we'll come back to diagnosis. Yes, sir. Uh, so uh, the examination in a, uh, this setting mainly helps us to uh, establish the severity of malabsorption, and in addition to that, it also might provide us certain clinical cues, clues that might help us uh, to get closer to the diagnosis. Uh, so uh, in our case, uh, the patient was fully con conscious and cooperative. He had. Uh, uh, blood pressure on the lower side, but uh, still in the normal range. Uh, he had no tachycardia, respiratory rate was normal. There was no pallor, ictress, cyanosis, or edema. But uh, important point was that clubbing was present. Uh, in anthropometry, the patient had a low BMI. Uh, BMI was 17.2 kg per meter square. And uh, uh, we could not make out any signs of micronutrient deficiency on general physical examination. Uh, systemic examination was also normal. Uh, he had a normal per abdominal examination. The respiratory system was normal. Uh, cardiovascular system and nervous system uh, examination was all normal. Uh, so uh, the only two more uh, findings, positive findings, let's say that we got from the general physical exam examination was that uh, clubbing was present and the patient had low BMI. Dr. Samagra, in a patient with a chronic diarrhea and suspected malabsorption, uh, can you just enumerate uh, the items which you look from head to foot, from the from the head to the 
uh, toenails what are the things which you normally look for and even if it is say you say no but this is relevant because you said signs of micronutrient deficiency and signs of uh, uh, calorie deprivation all those things no so what for the benefit of uh, all the others who are uh, listening this program can you enumerate the various signs you may look for from head to foot in a patient on dental examination uh, sir, uh, we can divide uh, them into signs of uh, macronutrient deficiency and micronutrient deficiency. Uh, okay. When we uh, talk about macronutrients, we are essentially looking at certain anthropometric measures. Um, we can look at uh, BMI. Uh, we can also uh, look at uh, tricep skin fold thickness, mid-arm muscle circumference that can help us establish the severity of fat and protein loss respectively. However, uh, those are not very routinely done. When we come to uh, micronutrient deficiencies, uh, we are uh, looking at water soluble and fat soluble vitamins. Among fat soluble vitamins, uh, uh, we can look for vitamin A deficiency. The patient uh, in history might complain of night blindness. Uh, on an examination, we might find uh, xerophthalmia, bitot spots. Uh, in vitamin D deficiency uh, is usually asymptomatic. However, if it is established at an early age, we might find some bony abnormalities. Vitamin K deficiency might present with easy bruisability uh, and uh, uh, bleeding from the gums. Uh, then we can have um, water soluble vitamin deficiencies. Vitamin, uh, vitamin B1 deficiency can present with the dry or wet beriberi that are classically described. Dry beriberi will have more of neuropathic signs. Wet beriberi will have more of uh, cardiac failure, a uh, high output cardiac failure. Uh, vitamin B2 deficiency present with the perioral signs in the form of kilosis and angular stomatitis. Uh, B3 deficiency presents with a uh, classical uh, uh, pellagra, which is a uh, classically described in form of uh, 3Ds, uh, dementia, uh, diarrhea, and uh, uh, skin rash. Uh, and uh, then we can have a uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, uh, which can present with uh, either anemia, or it can present with uh, uh, in the certain forms of neuropathy, uh, in the form of uh, uh, spinal cord involvement. Then we can also have certain mineral deficiencies in the form of iron deficiency, selenium deficiencies. Uh, those are relatively rare and uh, relatively hard to make out on clinical examination alone. Uh, but so apart uh, from nutrient deficiency, you should also look for other telltale signs of other diseases like pigmentation in yes, disease, pigmentation in tropical screw, then skin manifestation or additional skin manifestation, which may you may get in diseases. No, the disease specific uh, symptoms or signs also may be there on the skin. So general examination has to be thorough in a patient with a chronic diarrhea and malabs. That's the point which I wanted to tell everyone. Okay, sir. Okay, let's go further uh, now. Uh, how do you knit up the history and the physical findings? There is one uh, prominent physical finding, clubbing. So which yes. is uh, this uh, uh, chronic diarrhea where clubbing is a significant finding? We have a clue okay. now. Uh, sir, so, uh, immunoipsid uh, can have a uh, prominent clubbing. Uh, however, uh, a certain degree of clubbing has been described in other forms of malabsorption as well. So it points towards, uh, essentially what we can say is that it points towards a chronic disease, but we can't uh, uh, base our whole diagnosis uh, on a rare on diagnosis on, a, on just yeah. one physical finding. So even if CTAC and the tropical and the lymphoma, if yes. it have a very significant clubbing, if it is a very prominent clubbing, I think you will have to think of lymphoma. All other conditions, you have a minor or a mild form of clubbing. That's that's the difference. I think uh, if you go back to that differential diagnosis list, can we go back again? Yes, sir. It is forward. Yeah. Ah, so you look at tropical stroke, we had virtually excluded Crohn's disease. I would have kept it because of large bowel component. Celiac was unlikely. Lymphangiectasia, how had you kept it? Uh, the, so, uh, we had mainly considered uh, uh, features, uh, dif uh, diseases that are present with diffuse small bowel mucosal involvement. No, but uh, there are telltale features of lymphangiectasia. There's uh, uh, heavy protein loss, there's uh, ascites, there's pedal edema. There has to be something to suggest lymphangiectasia to keep it. Otherwise, why have you not kept, uh, for example, a beta lipoproteinemia or Whipple's disease? I mean, you keep the differential diagnosis considering uh, something there, some pointer. 
Yes, international lymphangiectasia to present at the age of 32 also is very unlikely. Yes. So, okay, I mean, here, uh, this uh, point is also very important. Yes. raised earlier also that uh, the possible differential have to be in the light of probability in a particular order rather than just enumerating the conditions and why is important samagra in case and all of you uh, that uh, based upon the clinical differential you are going to order investigation right and in that case i must know uh, as a clinician uh, treating patient that what test do i do where which have highest probability of Okay, so now uh, coming back again, so you have malabsorption, you have yes. chronic diarrhea with uh, weight loss and clubbing. I would say that that pain, I, I was not ready to buy that pain is just because of diarrhea. I would not still buy that pain is due to diarrhea. Celiac disease, whatever I have never seen with pain, unless there's a complication, tropical screw, again, pain is only, pain is not there. And GRDS is no pain, bacterial overgrowth, unless there is uh, blind loop syndrome or strictures, basically. Parasitic infestations like GRDS is no immunodeficiency. You have to have the whole gamut of uh, symptomatology. Ipsid, yes. Crohn's disease, yes. Uh, any condition interpreting, uh, interrupting the motility, you can have pain. So that, 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 I would have felt it uh, slightly differently uh, on your interpretation of pain. But anyway, you go sir, forward. I had, I had one question, sir. Uh, can we consider, uh, uh, for the examination point of view uh, at least, uh, can we consider a rare diagnosis as a first differential, uh, especially when uh, we do not see it that frequently? Uh, even if uh, other uh, uh, diagnosis which are more common but rarer presentations of those diseases can be still there. You you mean like in this case, could you have considered Ipsid as number uh, yes, one? Yes, that is that is my question. Yes, sir. yes, I would have said celiac disease number one, Crohn's disease number two, Ipsid number three. Okay, because of celiac is the commonest in this part of the world, Crohn's disease could have explained everything, including the pain. And Ipsid again because of pain, and if you have clubbing, it adds to uh, yeah. it's very, very strong. May, may I comment on that? Uh, yeah, yeah, please, Dr. So this, this, this man is from West Champaran district in Bengal, where celiac disease is not that common. Uh, you know, I would actually put parasitic infections up on top. Uh, I mean, Crohn's. Celiac, we could consider Ipsid, yes, because he's younger age and the clubbing. Ipsid would be stronger if you were able to palpate a mass in the abdomen. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, but I do agree with your general trend, except for celiac. <laughs> celiac and its complications, certainly, yes, to be considered. But probably, since he's from Bengal, probably yeah, maybe not right that, that factor could be, yes. Uh, in the, I would say, Hindi speaking belt, uh, as you, you, are part of that work that uh, celiac yeah. is all over now. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Actually, uh, he belongs to West Chamberlain, that is in Bihar, but most of the time he is touring all over the India to audit uh, the energy consumption. So, in okay. that scenario, whether to attribute diarrhea to such an such some condition that are more prevalent in Bihar, or to take a take consideration to his travel to all part of India. Anyway, traveler's diarrhea will not be like this uh, <laughs> for four years. With uh, okay, we have to thank you. We have uh, not covered parasitic infestation. Professor Kocha, do we have to mention at least the name of the parasitic infestation which will produce a chronic recurrent diarrhea and weight loss? Can we complete yes, yes. that and then proceed? Uh -huh. Yes, Samagra has the list. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, so, uh a certain number of uh, parasites, especially in a certain limited kind of immunocompromise, can cause uh, chronic diarrhea. Uh, chronic giardiasis has been described in uh, certain uh, renal transplant patients, especially in post-transplant setting and uh, selective immunodeficiencies. Uh, strongyloidis has been described. Uh, and uh, then we can also have some rarer uh, parasitic infections uh, that include uh, microsporidia. Uh, 
which which can be present uh, however again uh, uh, considering all these uh, i would still not keep it in my first differential considering the case that we have presented. Which, which, which are the uh, most prominent parasites causing malabsorption uh sir uh giardias yeah. and uh, strongyloides probably okay but and some don't... which we don't see in uh, generally don't see in india So, uh, so, 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 can I come in here again? Yes, yes. So, so, coccidian infections, which are intraepithelial parasites in the small intestine, we see them, of course, more more in patients with immunodeficiencies, but we do see them as causes of chronic diarrhea in patients without significant immunodeficiency. Uh, so, so these would include things like retrosporidium, obviously, uh, and uh, isospora pelli, and what are now classified as fungal infections, which are the microsporidiosis. Yes, and often, uh, often the diagnosis is difficult because you know our investigation is not geared to that. Yes, uh, that is true. Primarily in immunodeficient, yes, and as you say, maybe in non-immunodeficient also. The parasite I was referring to is that diphilobothrium latum. Latum, latum. It is yeah. Yes, yeah. so to, that is to complete the list uh, that if you could talk of Whipple's disease or a beta lipoproteinemia, we could talk of that also to, you know, make the list ready for all the uh, students. There's a good list of things in Schlesinger, including capillaria, Philippine and cis. Capillaria, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, I also agree with uh, Professor Kochar that my differential diagnosis would be an atypical celiac, then again Crohn's with uh, some atypicality, Ipsi. Still, I am not, uh, I don't want to rule out immunodeficiency syndrome, either acute or uh, congenital, uh, because the symptomatology is strongly in favor of this weight loss. I am very much concerned. It's interesting are, that TB did not make it to this list. You know, we have already we always considered as a differential diagnosis for Crohn's. Uh, yes. For yes. the information of everyone, we have reached no, twelve fifty no. to ask for the allotted timing. We have only eight minutes. Uh, Professor Makaria uh, may give us another fifteen minutes. So, can we proceed further? Uh, 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 Varghese, uh, yes. uh, the, the question asked is uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the participant asked. Uh, one or two so just to close the answer to that, that uh, for diarrhea to occur, we need to have a large segment of small and large segment of intestine to affect it. Tuberculosis is generally unifocal disease and it's only small segment of uh, a small and large intestine. Therefore, diarrhea, uh, to, diarrhea is not a very important differential. Uh, look, tuberculosis is not an important differential in this kind of diarrhea, which is a more watery, more large volume. So, so if at all diarrhea will occur in tuberculosis, it's more of a uh, more of a SIBO uh, types uh, rather than of a malabjective type. Therefore, tuberculosis has not been kept. Although some patient tuberculosis is also uh, could be diffuse involvement, but there are only few. Therefore, TB is not important difference. Uh, can we go to about eosinophilic enteritis? Now, there's a question about eosinophilic enteritis. Can it be considered? Absolutely. I think a pain also will be a dominant manifestation. I think it comes in the immediate differential diagnosis of Crohn's disease. Uh, most of the features are uh, uh, similar. I think pain is a dominant manifestation of that condition also. So if you keep Crohn's low in the list, uh, then yes, no, like also. And normally we would have, you know, yes, uh, just a, uh, one word only that with the Ipsid, we have to keep uh, diffuse intestinal lymphoma also. Uh, Ipsid is a very, very specific thing and as Samagra had asked that, can you keep Ipsid as number one? Uh, it is no. A, no, no, never sir, never sir, because it is a rare thing in our country. Yes, it so but lymphoma can figure in uh, reasonably high up in any yeah. differential diagnosis of chronic diarrhea with such significant weight loss. Uh, yes, topics, uh, I just make a, I want to make a one point out here that uh, the I just said that you make diagnosis based upon the commonality of things. That's a wonderful thing to do. But we as a specialist, we are tertiary care center. 
and all of the gastroenterologists will will be at Tercy Care and in big hospital in and we have a Tercy Care Center. So this analogy of common disease commonly will not always apply to us. So we need to keep if the signs and symptoms are suggestive of particular disease, even say rare, we need to think of uh, if they are if they did, if there is no no specific point to bring to go to an uncommon disease is fine, but if there are specific signs, even if it's uncommon, this could be only one diagnosis in a given patient. Uh, I mean, we need to because we we are a tertiary care center. We are not at a primary care center, right? With this, can you go to uh, the how do we investigate this patient? And we have now time left is uh, almost ten to fifteen minutes, so let's go quickly. Uh. So uh, should I just briefly summarize the investigations and uh, so that in the interest of time? So what do you want? What are your principles of invest? What kind of principles? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so I would uh, like to divide my investigative work up into uh, two arms. One would be to uh, establish the etiology of uh, malabsorption and diarrhea. And the second would be to uh, establish the severity of malabsorption and uh, uh, diarrhea in this case. The severity, uh, establishing severity is important because the because of the fact that our most of our management will be directed uh, based on the how severe malabsorption we have got so uh, for establishing uh, whether or not malabsorption is present and the severity of malabsorption uh, we start with uh, uh, routine blood parameters like uh, complete blood count with a peripheral smear uh, lft uh, kft and uh, along with that uh, 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 then we would uh, like to uh, go to some uh, stool examination uh, to establish uh, that how much of the malabsorption is occurring. Uh, and uh, then we can also have some etiological workup that goes along with it. We can do uh, serum markers for celiac disease like uh, IgA, TTG. We can do a immunoglobulin profile to assess uh, whether the patient has uh, any selective immunoglobulin deficiency. Uh, we can also uh, do a stool workup for atypical parasites, including a uh, stool antigen. Uh, uh, then following that, we would like to move on to, if none of this workup helps us point to a certain direction, we would like to move on to uh, endoscopic evaluation. Uh, we would uh, first uh, do a upper GI endoscopy and a duodenal biopsy. Uh, and along with that, a uh, colonoscopy. Uh, and uh, if uh, we find any pathology in the ileum, we can go for ileum. Ileal biopsies and colonic colonic biopsies as well. Based on that, uh, that will help us plan further workup, and uh, then we can uh, go ahead and decide uh, whether we should go um, with more selective tests. Uh, I have not covered uh, uh, HIV workup has also. Imaging you have not covered yet. Yes, sir. Please continue. Imaging is an important investigation. Uh, yes, sir. No? Yes, sir. Uh, imaging, imaging uh, if uh, in this case will help, help us rule out certain structuring diseases of the bowel and will also, uh, in certain cases, uh, give us certain uh, pathological findings, like uh, if the whole bowel is diffusely inflamed, if there is a diffuse involvement of the bowel, or if there is diffuse uh, infiltration and edema of the bowel. That can be identified in, the, in this case. Plus uh, pancreas. Pancreas. Uh, yes, the pancreas can also be involved in these cases. So let us uh, see the investigations in that order. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, so uh, we have uh, serial hemograms. The patient has been uh, evaluated multiple times over the past four years, and. Uh, uh, we can see that the hemoglobin has been uh, essentially normal and uh, there has been a slight reduction in platelet count over the past uh, four years. Uh, peripheral smear showed normocytic normochromic RBC and TLC was also adequate with no atypical cells. Uh, if we look at the liver and renal function tests, the renal function tests are normal uh, with the normal sodium and potassium. However, uh, uh, one interesting finding is that the patient has persistently low globulin. Uh, now, this gl low globulin could be a part of uh, malabsorption or it could also be a part of uh, primary disease. Uh, in the sense, uh, the patient might have uh, selective immunoglobulin deficiencies. Uh, uh, when we then we come to basic etiological workup, we did uh, IgTTG were done multiple times, uh, and both of the times it were negative. 
uh, HLA genotyping was also done, uh, and it was uh, HLA DQ2 was positive. Stool routine uh, has been stool has been examined multiple times, which did not show any ova, cyst, or acid fast bacilli. Giardia and Cryptosporidium antigen were also negative. Uh, however, uh, jejunal aspirate was done once in 2019 that showed MDR pseudomonas. Uh, I'm not sure of the significance of that, and that could uh, very well be a contaminant in that setting. Uh, Anti-HIV has been done multiple times, and it has always been negative. Uh, however, uh, something uh, that is interesting is the immunoglobulin profile, uh, which has been also been done multiple times. And uh, IgA has been deficient on two of the occasions, and IgM has been deficient on multiple occasions. And IgG also has been deficient on both the occasions uh, when it has been measured. Uh, so uh, this immunoglobulin profile certainly points towards uh, immunodeficiency, whether it is primary or secondary, will again require uh, uh, certain investigations. Upper GI endoscopy has also been done multiple times, and uh, it was essentially normal except for last upper GI endoscopy that was done here that showed uh, small nodular lesions in duodenal mucosa. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if uh, they are very evident, but uh, this is a they have some small small nodules are present in the duodenum, and multiple duodenal biopsies has all have also been done, including one jejunal biopsy in 2019. Uh, duodenal biopsies mainly showed uh, one of them showed mildly flattened and blunted villi with crypt hyperplasia, and uh, but a repeat biopsy showed largely maintained villus architecture. A jejunal biopsy showed focal neutrophilic infiltration with occasional cryptitis and uh, normal crypt architecture. Uh, a duodenal biopsy that was uh, then done in April 2021 showed mild lymphocytic, lymphoplasmacytic inflammation with many pear-shaped trophozoites suggestive of giardia. Colonoscopy has also been done once. Uh, it was done in 2018. Uh, showed only uh, multiple small could nodules. Do, in the we do colonoscopy in this patient? It was done for actually. Let me skip. If you want to do, then we let's consider. Otherwise, skip this uh, because this will give a, a wrong connotation to our, our all our participants that uh, all investigations have been done indiscriminately. So let's skip this uh, unless you want to do colonoscopy. Because let's not include those investigations which we don't want to do. Yes, sir. Because otherwise, uh, there will be wrong message going to all 400 participants out here. Uh, sure. Uh, Mahindra, please don't show those investigations which are not relevant. Probably this was done elsewhere. Right. Okay. Proceed, please. In, anyway, but this gives the wrong connotation to all our all our participants that uh, every patient with chronic diarrhea should have a both upper GI and lower GI colonoscopy. Which is not justifiable. Yes, sir. Uh, to uh, establish the severity of uh, malabsorption, uh, uh, we also uh, a urine desilo test was also done in 2019, uh, which was uh, which showed uh, r r low urine uh, desilose levels. And uh, we also have uh, one imaging, uh, multiple imaging done over the past few years, uh, which. Uh, showed essentially normal bowel with the multiple small mesenteric lymph nodes. So uh, that essentially concludes the uh, investigative workup that we have at this point. So what is your final diagnosis? Uh, uh, yes, sir. So uh, to summarize you, the investigation. You, you could go back to the previous one you were showing, yes. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we have uh, one report of CRP uh, that was uh, less than 0.3. Uh, TSH was uh, normal. Lipid profile has been normal. Fecal calprotectin has been done two times, which is uh, positive. Uh, this, uh, again, is uh, not very specific, but uh, can indicate uh, that a certain inflammation is going on in the bowel. Uh, whether it is related to infection or uh, inflammatory bowel disease, that is not clear at this point. This cholesterol and triglycerides are low, uh, low, 82 and 87. Yeah. Very low, very low. So this would fit so, in. In fact, which uh, chronic diarrhea, malabsorption have low cholesterol and triglycerides? I think when they lose it, how do, how do they lose it? That oh. happens in infant, intestinal infantic case here. 
you also you always keep a possibility of a b severe level. fat malabsorption beta lipoprotein emia we have beta carotene levels we don't have beta carotene levels okay and calcium and uh, prothrombin time uh, yes sir those were all uh, normal uh, normal sir uh, calcium was uh, 8.2 okay. which was on um, slightly lower side but uh -huh. and here and they uh, and un usually high hemoglobin all the while it's 16 17 grams to start with yes sir 18 18 in fact so any any cause for that 18 is rather high do we uh, have the P pcv uh so uh, we had a full peripheral smear done uh, the pcv was normal okay so dr samagra please summarize the abnormal <clears throat> findings on lab Uh, yes, sir. So uh, to uh, summarize the investigations, uh, we uh, have uh, multiple investigations done over the past four years, and there is persistent hypoglobinemia, uh, and all globulin flag fractions are in fact low. Uh, we have uh, documented lymphoid hyperplasia in form of uh, histopathology from uh, duodenum, jejunum, ileum, as well as mesenteric lymphadenopathy visible on imaging, uh, and we have uh, documented recurrent GI infections. We have one. Uh, a uh, jejunal aspirate that showed mdr pseudomonas and then we have grdr documented in the recent uh, uh, duodenal biopsy and we have uh, features of ongoing malabsorption in the form of positive dyxylostes that is what uh, essentially the investigations tell us mm. how about the low platelet count the platelet count on august uh, 2021 was around 50000 only no how did yes, it are we missing something Uh, yes, I could not explain the platelet count with the investigations that oh, we sir, had. Rajesh Kuchar uh, has already said that uh, there is some uh, elevated hemoglobin. Is uh, are we missing some hematological issues as well? Uh, okay. Do we have the kid, uh, renal functions? Uh, no, uh, yes, sir. Uh, renal fun. We have the renal function test, sir. Uh, urine, urine, uh, albumin. Uh, uh, we we do not have the urine albumin at it's this point. But, albumin, uh, but perfect serum albumin is perfect. It's only I go globulin emia. Globulin. So globulins could be lost in uh, urine. Either there's primary hypo gamma globulin emia or yeah, he has already low IgG, IgM, and IgS. Yes, so yes. The common variable immunodeficiency is established with the yes. uh, this test and the duodenal findings of uh, nodular lymphoid hyperplasia. GRDS that all everything goes together. What does not go together is the significant malabsorption. Jejunal biopsy is uh, or duodenal biopsy is uh, totally unremarkable or a minimal finding. And again, significant dyxylos test. So there are missing points. Uh, that is what I would say. Uh, Samagra, can you go just have some learning experience? Can you go to slide of protein? Slide of protein. Let's, yes. Uh, so look at uh, to all of you. Uh, this point is very important in any patient with chronic diarrhea. And once we don't make a diagnosis clinically and we remain in different diagnosis, looking at the serum protein value itself is a very important clinical parameter. That you very well find that the low albumin, uh, it's low globulin, a normal albumin. Always think of hypogamma in this setting of chronic diarrhea, and confirm by doing IgG, IgG, IgM to confirm that is it only isolated IgA, IgA deficiency or it is a uh, multiple immunoglobin deficiency. Confirm diagnosis of CVID. One, if you have both low, both sodium is if albumin is low and globulin is low, it means it's a pan pan hypoproteinemia. Then you will consider lymphatic disorder, loss of whole protein. Uh, some amount of protein using entropy, which can occur in 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 relationship with the lymphangiectasia, induce disease of into loss of protein, like Crohn's disease. So protein, looking at protein report, which we always ignore while looking at LFT, we are tuned and have we are mind have been tuned to look at only albumin. Protein means albumin. We never look at globulin, but looking at globulin in patient chronic diarrhea itself it gives you a diagnosis. Of Of uh, of uh, this thing. Second point: you look at if you have look at any patient chronic diarrhea, you have low cholesterol. Uh, although very rare disease, low cholesterol, low LDL, low TG. Or think of a beta. But it is bringing different diagnoses as a beta lipoproteinemia. 
because cholesterol can occur because of a diffuse uh, absorptive defect. But if you have a cholesterol is very low, then you should also be considered a beta proteinemia. And third point I want to make that uh, all of this patient diffuse because of disease, differential of differential of celiac disease, topical sprue, uh, or, or, or for example, toxic disorders. You wouldn't like to do a luminal imaging like CT endography. CT endography will be a second level investigation. The first level, there's no need to do a luminal imaging unless you want, unless you're considering a luminal etiology like a, like like a, like a Crohn's disease. Then do a luminal imaging. So CT endography may not be a great test to do as a first line uh, in if you're thinking of uh, celiac or tropical or such disorders. All right. Uh, uh, the Kramakasan make a point. Have we, uh, we, are, uh, we are so far hinting at uh, primary immunoglobulin deficiency. Uh, still, do we need to rule out secondary, like in lymphoma or renal disease? Do we need to go any further with that? No, I think with the normal albumin, we don't need to do that. Okay. But I still feel that uh, uh, with the uh, minimal um, mucosal biopsy findings, D xylose test is abnormal. I think the, another, there's a question about D xylose. Is D xylose test a test of carbohydrate malabsorption or a test of mucosal integrity? It is a mucosal integrity. We are not it, testing it, carbohydrate. It's actually, so, so again, may, may I just make a point there? It's not a test of carbohydrate absorption or of mucosal integrity. Okay. It's a question of mucosal surface. Surface. surface area. You you know very well, David Rolston demonstrated that the thing, it's, it's, it's surface area. Mucosal integrity, you'll have to do dual sugar absorption tests. Yes, yes, that manitol uh, lactose, yeah, lactose, 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 lactose Okay. Uh, there's a question from the, uh, one of the participants that uh, he received antibiotic multiple times. Would you consider the possibility of partially treated uh, tropical sprue? So here, this is something that we were talking about initially. That's why I asked this three months, cotrimoxazole and tinidazole, which he received. And it led to prolonged uh, resolution, say, for two years of symptoms. So it, it could be, I mean, I mean, looking now, it looks like it is common variable immunodeficiency with recurrent small bowel infections, which cause the diarrhea. But it looks like that a three-month prolonged uh, course did lead to a lot of uh, prolonged uh, remission of symptoms. Uh, the, another point, important point, uh, uh, just to uh, enumerate out here, that to say tropical sprue, we say uh, the chronic diarrhea is there in 100% patients, uh, wherein celiac disease and other disorder is not at 100%. The reason being that uh, Thinking of tropical sprue starts from chronic diarrhea. We don't think of tropical sprue in those patients who come to with anemia or such disorders. Uh, in almost all patients have that, but in celiac disease, uh, you think beyond tropical, uh, beyond chronic diarrhea. You think in terms of anemia in, in those patients who have short stretcher or other other uh, manifestations. Therefore, celiac disease have a less uh, patient of diarrhea. Tropical flu, almost everyone has. The reason being that we start thinking about tropical once the patient has chronic diarrhea. A uh, couple of more questions come that, uh, that uh, uh, could it be still celiac disease? Uh, although we have a more pointed towards CVID, but can you rule out celiac disease? Because his IgA TTG is negative. He's also IgA deficient. So does he also have a combined, we, ag we agree with uh, uh, you, Samagra and Mukesh, that this could be CVID. But does he has underlying celiac also, or have we ruled out completely? Sir, uh, I would like to make a comment. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, sir. Uh, very apt that there's IgA deficiency, so we may not have a positive IgGTZ test. Uh, but in this case, uh, when he was put for three months on antibiotic and also on gluten free diet, after 2020, he started taking. Goatee, I mean, wheat and other product that could have uh, gluten there, but he did not have recurrence of symptoms. So, I would like to know as well whether 
at some point of time in history of celiac disease consumption of wheat wheat or uh, gluten containing diet may not lead actually to re relax of symptoms for quite a long period of time if no then i think this excludes the possibility of celiac all right there's another question from chat box that uh, if it is cvit then why does not he have features in the skin or respiratory tract this is a question by or comment by dr bhavik joshi all patient with a common variable immunodeficiency may not have all the typical symptoms uh, because they agree that they have sinopulmonary infection and ga infections uh, but uh, here of course there is invariably proof of uh, uh, iga igm and igg deficiency with the nodal import hyperplasia giardiasis so ga part is 100% certain i think in this case uh, uh, the, i don't know about the other system um, usually there may be sinopulmonary infections also that's the picture <laughs> Uh, the other question is uh, uh, again. One of the questions come that how would you now confirm CVID? Okay, we have a clinical suspicion has come that, uh, or we also have a blood parameter suggesting low immunoglobin levels, all three of them. But next step to confirm CVID, or you are happy to to label him as a CVID. Okay, so but the answer to the question is uh, that uh, you will now. So these are the supportive evidences. But to confirm, we need to do, look at so the beta cell uh, beta cell switch switch memory, and for that we require a specific immune uh, studies, uh, which will not be available to every point every place. Uh, therefore, uh, if any patient chronic diarrhea, if we have a low IgG IgG IgM, uh, you are almost certain this is a CVID. But you can confirm by doing a B cell switch memory tests. Uh, other question is what about doing HLA? If you think it's celiac, would you do DQ2? Is a question by Chandra Khan. DQ2 was negative in this patient? Uh, HLA DQ2 was in fact positive. Uh, and positive. That was the reason for recommending gluten free diet in this patient uh, earlier on. Uh, that makes it complicated. So, it may not be comp that complicated because DQ2 may be positive in 30% of healthy individuals. So therefore, a presence does not uh, make much sense. But again, if you have to think of celiac, then probably this is important just to look at. Uh, but DQ2 will be, will be positive in 30% of uh, normal people. Normal. If it was negative, we could have ruled it, ruled it out completely. So that ruling out is not possible now. Yes, we, we would uh, should do IgG, uh, TTG as well. True. So, uh, I have also low. IgG is also low, sir. IgG is also low. IgG is also low. Yes. So uh, I have one question that uh, when we have uh, around four or five duodenal biopsies in this patient and none of them have showed any degree of intraepithelial lymphocytosis, uh, even if uh, let's say uh, we find any uh, evidence of celiac disease in the form of EMA positivity, uh, will we uh, strongly consider celiac as a cause of diarrhea in this patient? So if we have an EMA positive, then certainly you have to, EMA is again IgA. So EMA, because IgA deficiency, EMA will be falsely negative. But EMA is positive, then you will think of is playing a role. Also remember, uh, this is some point of time, probably time we don't allow to discuss this today. Uh, but again, there's an, remember that skin and blood are replicated in the cells, right? So they replicate every third day. The mucosa can get damaged and replaced very fast. Despite being busy, they may not be uh, evident on the biopsies. Uh, a couple of more questions take that uh, uh, is, uh, would you, any test will tell, tell you vaccine response testing in confirming CVID? Vaccine response testing for confirming CVID. Suppose somebody B virus and B virus uh, antibody, vaccine of B virus. We don't have any HPS. So this should be pointed that this person is unable to make it. Uh, in HPS IgG, defining deficiency. I think with this, uh, if Dr. Kocher, Dr. Varghis, and Dr. Ramachandran allows, we need to close because we are at 115, 120 uh, on a, a holiday and it's lunch time. So uh, if you agree, can we start the closing? Uh, Okay, so so uh, 
it has been a wonderful experience to discuss uh, an case with chronic diarrhea and malabsorption. Uh, Samagra and uh, Mukesh, you did a wonderful job to discuss and bring forth the, some of the important points uh, which we wanted to highlight uh, while dealing with patients with chronic diarrhea and malabsorption. Although one and a half hours time is not the uh, great time, but we made some very important uh, learning experience out here today. And uh, some of the important points to look at uh, that while treating a patient with chronic diarrhea, we always look at this. You try to learn the approach to uh, patient with systematic uh, feature, systematic order, and look at six or seven points uh, to confirm that where your disease lies. Is it small intestine, large intestine, if small intestine diffuse, or, or it is a local disease. And uh, we had uh, one of the uh, uh, uncommon patients, CVID, and the pointer, pointer was uh, low globulin. So whenever patient you see patient with chronic diarrhea, always look at a uh, uh, globulin level. Uh, uh, which we are not reported on the biopsy, reporting the NFT. We get only albumin report. So total protein minus albumin is globulin. So always derive globulin report effectively. We just look at albumin and close by. So this couple of learning experiences, uh, maybe close this session, maybe invite Dr. Kocher. Uh, to say some words. Yeah, I think uh, it was a wonderful clinical exercise, thought-provoking, and with a lesson to all that how do you approach a patient of chronic diarrhea and uh, how to look at the smaller, finer print of uh, globulins and go further than that. So uh, thank you, everybody, for a good interactive session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kocher. Thank you, Dr. Ramakrishna. Thank you, Dr. Vergis, for a wonderful interaction and making some of the important clinical points, uh, which uh, we should remember while dealing with patients with chronic diarrhea. With this, we close the session for today. And, and we, we will meet again. I will see, you, see all of you uh, next week on Sunday at 11.30. Uh, again, uh, with a new case. And here you will be patients with uh, uh, more like uh, intestinal obstructive disease, where there's an intestinal structure, and how to approach to a patient with that. This time we'll have patient from uh, PGI uh, Chandigarh, and we'll have a two participant from PGI Chandigarh uh, with a new set of faculty will will join the session next Sunday. We'll we'll look forward to see all of you for next Sunday at the same time using the same link, and and as we go along, we'll have patients and residents uh, from every part of country. So this was from today from New Delhi. Next time we'll have Chandigarh. Then we have a Kolkata, Hyderabad, Mumbai, uh, Calicut, or, or Trivandrum, uh, every, from every place uh, with uh, 12 different uh, uh, cases from two, 12 different places with 12, 12 different uh, sets of residents. And we'll notify you uh, who is going to participate at what point of time. With this, we close the session and we thank you all. Uh, and we'll look forward to see you next Sunday at 11.30. Uh, thank you so very much again, and have a great day ahead. Uh, thank you, Dinesh, uh, for organizing this. Thank you, Yogita, for organizing uh, this session. OK, bye-bye. Log bye. off now. Bye. Congrats to Mukesh and Samagra. Absolutely fantastic job today. Fantastic job. Bye-bye. It was a difficult case, I agree. <laughs> but they did a wonderful job. All right, bye-bye. See you next week. Bye.